Hello and welcome. So with this video, we are doing another uh, solo, uh, an application of the solo model, uh, and we're going to be thinking about the effect of an increase in the savings rate or a change in the savings rate. Uh, and then the model we're dealing with is kind of like the quote unquote full solo swan model, model with uh, labor augmented technology as well as population growth. Um, so an outline that I'm planning on covering uh, is I'm going to start off with a discussion of how the change in saving rate is going to affect things uh, via an analysis, you know, with a solo diagram, and then we'll get to time series. Uh, and then this, the change in the savings rate is kind of an interesting one. Uh, so I'll talk about the kind of like the more interesting parts of that. Okay, so first off, change in the savings rate. Um, what, what does that do? Well, the savings rate is right here, right? So this is the solo diagram. Uh, and then this red line is our investment line. So a change in the savings rate is definitely going to shift this um, uh, investment line here. Uh, there's no savings rate. Uh, savings rate doesn't affect um, production per effective worker, and it doesn't change that break-even investment line. So it's just changing, it's just shifting this investment line. And if we increase savings, uh, which is the setup of our question, that's going to shift up this line. So um, that you know, uh, we're going to kind of assume that we start off this this little scenario um, where we were at the steady state level of capital per worker. So we're at this lower level of K star over here. And then what happens when we increase the savings rate? Well, if we increase the savings rate, we start off right here. And if we increase the savings rate, you can see that shifts up the investment line. This is the light blue line in this Wolfram Alpha demonstration thing. Uh, and it increases the new uh, steady state level of capital per effective worker. So when we shift up the red line, you would uh, we'll have a new intersection um, where the investment line intersects the break-even investment line. Uh, and so the new steady state level of capital per effective worker will be something higher over here. So that's what's going to happen to our new steady state, but uh, what about the rest? Um, well, the rest are all determined by these things, right? So here are per effective, uh, per, per effective worker levels, so capital per effective worker and output per effective worker. Um, we can see that they're definitely steady states, right? Because they their growth rate is zero. Um, and we see the things that kind of shift their levels, right? So if we increase the savings rate, that's gonna shift up, uh, that's gonna have a positive level effect. Um, and then you know, the other effects there. So that's, capital per effective worker, but what about capital per worker? Well, keep in mind that capital per worker grows at rate G, where G is the growth rate of technology, labor augmented technology. Um, but this S, the savings rate, does have a positive level effect on capital per worker. And then we also see that the savings rate also has level effects on um, all our major aggregate um, variables of interest too, like aggregate capital, um, aggregate output. So um, what would that look like you know, in a time series. Well, I created this nice little spreadsheet here. It actually doesn't take too long for you to put together too, where we have all of our variables of interest, and I just kind of chose random, arbitrary, you know, initial starting points for our little parameters and initial values of capital. And I plugged in, you know, uh, in previous videos, we walked through all the details of the model, like the nitty gritty details of uh, formulas that determine each of these variables. We just applied those formulas and then let it run through time to see what happens, and we get the following time series. So if you remember the solo diagram, we uh, started off at a low steady state level of capital per effective worker, and then with the increase in the savings rate, which I'm going to mark off right at this little dotted line, we saw a new steady state level of capital per effective worker. So the steady state level definitely jumped from here up to this new level instantaneously. However, capital per effective worker is determined by a uh, accumulation process. Do you remember, remember that law of motion of capital equation that we had before? Um, and it, it shows, it determines how capital per effective worker evolves through time. So even though there's new higher rate, which has a new steady state, um, in order for us to go from this lower level of capital per effective worker to this higher level of capital per effective worker, we have to use this kind of transition dynamics. Um, which is which is controlled by that law of motion of capital. Um, and it's going to go by this process. So this is the transition, right? So initially, there's a fast spurt in increase in capital per effective worker. And then over time, it evolves and approaches asymptotically the new steady state level. So you might ask yourself, well, why is it an initial big jump when the increase in capital per effective worker is very fast, but then it slows down? Well, that uh, we could think about by turning to um, the solo diagram. So uh, 
this is how it was. So, so suppose this k star right here is the new level, the new steady state level, right? So uh, after we had the increase in savings, we, we jumped up to this new level here. Um, but we were at this lower level of capital perfective worker, right? So we're at this lower level of capital perfective worker and our new steady state's up here and higher. So what's the transition dynamics to control that, that process, that dynamic process? So if we're at a lower level of capital perfective worker, somewhere down here, and the new steady, the steady state's up here, well, what happens here is this red line is above the blue line. The red line is investment per effective worker. Uh, what's investment? Well, investment is, you know, you earn amount of, some amount of income. That's, that's a Y variable is your income. Uh, and you convert some of that, set by the savings rate, uh, into investment. That investment then gets turned into capital and is added to the capital stock. So this red line is like the, is the amount that, of your income that you're adding to the capital stock. So this red line is the, is basically saying that's how much I want to add to the capital stock. This blue line we call the break-even investment line. That's the amount of capital you need to add each period in order to keep capital per effective worker constant. So remember there's depreciation, right? That destroys some capital. So obviously you need to add a bit more capital each period. Uh, remember that there's population growth. So this is in a per effective worker like variable. This is capital per effective worker. So if there's population growing, there's new people entering the labor force, and each of those new people needs to be given some amount of capital. Um, so in order to keep capital per effective worker constant, it also needs to take into account population growth. And then the other thing is this is per effective worker. Um, we have population, so we have technology growth, that labor augmenting technology. So in order to keep capital per effective worker, where effective is, you know, adjusted by our uh, technology variable, in order to keep that capital per effective worker constant, we need to also increase the amount of capital as technology increases. So that's, that's why those three growth rates are put into, or the two growth rates and depreciation are put into there. Um, and so we call it break-even investment because it's the amount of investment required to keep capital per effective worker constant. So if investment is above capital per effective worker, then the amount that we're adding to the capital per effective worker stock is greater than the amount required to keep it constant. And so uh, capital per effective worker is going to increase by the difference between these two. So you can see up here, you know, say, say this point right here where I'm pointing out with my little weird fit pointer thing is significantly above the blue line. So we're going to increase at that point capital perfective worker to the next period. Now the next period, once again, the red line is slightly above the blue line. And uh, in that period, we're going to increase capital perfective worker by that difference. Um, so as you can see, there's this like incremental effect. And uh, the red line is, appears to be, you know, fairly significantly above the blue line down at this lower level of capital perfective worker. But as we, as the, as the capital perfective worker stock increases as it gets closer and closer, you know, converges towards the new steady state level, you can see that that investment line is only slightly above the break-even investment line. So at this point, um, investment is only slightly above break-even investment. So the addition to capital per effective worker stock is only is relatively small. So when we look at the time series, you know, once again, you see those big jumps, you know, at the lower capital per effective worker. Um, and as it gets closer and closer, the addition to the stock of capital perfective worker is smaller and smaller and smaller. And in other words, it just approaches asymptotically to that new steady state level. And that's kind of like the, the intuition of the dynamics. So that's capital perfective worker, right? So that's a perfective per worker basis. But let's think about um, it in terms of per capital, per capita levels. So it's like per worker levels. Um, how do things change per capita levels, right? So this is um, log capital per worker, and this is log output capital. Uh, this is log output per worker. So why, why am I doing log? Well, over here I, do, I don't do log, and you can see how the growth rates are asymptotic. You know, they're, they're not straight lines. Uh, it's because things are growing, and so they grow, asymptotic, they grow exponentially. Um, excuse me, exponential, not asymptotic. So uh, because these things are growing exponentially, if we convert them to the log, it turns converts the growth rates to the just slopes here. So this dotted gray line indicates the point at which we increase the savings rate. So we were we did have capital per worker right here. It's growing at rate G, if you remember back to that chart of all our growth rates. 
capital per worker and output per worker, they grow at rate G, which is the growth rate of technology. And then in this problem, we've changed the savings rate, so it doesn't do anything to the growth rate of capital per worker or output per worker. But when we increase the savings rate, that's going to shift up the steady state level of capital per worker. So capital per worker is going to shift up through that, that pro process of convergence I had just described. Um, and so as capital per worker is slowly sl shifting up, uh, sorry, as capital per effective worker slowly shifts up that k-hat um, through the process that I'd walked through down there, then uh, you're going to see capital per worker follow a similar, you know, uh, convergence process to this new growth path. So uh, when we talk about steady states, like the steady state level of capital per effective worker, steady state in the sense that, you know, it's, we're dealing with a constant value. So it was at this lower steady state, and now it's at this lower steady state. When we think about cap capital per worker, it's no longer a steady state, right? It's this thing that's growing at rate G, at the rate of technology growth. And so we had this balanced growth path, and now we have this growth path. And so we shift up by levels. That's what we mean by the level shift. Um, and then output per worker is a very similar story. Remember, output per worker is just a function of capital per worker. So it's very similar. It just looks like a different scale. And then the other thing that I wanted to focus on, which I think is much more interesting uh, when we deal with a change in savings, is let's talk about consumption per worker and investment per worker. So remember, consumption per worker is probably the best proxy we have for welfare in the solar model. Well, welfare is like how good people are doing, you know, so in, in the civil economy, there's two things that people could do. They could invest, which is basically save, or they could consume, which is spend their money on things that make them better off, right? So that's the best kind of little proxy we have for how well people are doing this economy. So the kind of, the, to me, one thing that's driving uh, an interest in this model is, uh, well, what can we do to increase this particular variable consumption? Um, and what is, so what determines consumption per worker? Well, consumption and investment per worker, all you do is you take output per worker, right? So output per worker is that output per effective worker times technology. So you take output per worker. And uh, for investment, you times that by the savings rate. And then for consumption, you take output per worker and you times it by one minus the savings rate. So, you know, the, the logic with those two, with investment and consumption, is that when you, you get a certain amount of income and you have two options, you can invest it, save it, convert it into capital, or you could consume it, use it, make yourself happy. You know, uh, the the parameter that determines investment is, is savings. So all that's left over, one minus the savings rate, that's going to be what the the rate of consumption. So one minus s is the consumption rate, I guess you could say. So total consumption at any one period is going to be one minus the savings rate times output per person. So what happens? Right, the little gray dotted line here for consumption per worker and the gray little dotted line here for investment per worker is the moment we increase the savings rate. So you can see investment jumps up automatically, right? Because investment is just the savings rate times output per worker. So it takes output per worker, which is where I'm pointing at, and it increases the savings rate. Then the other thing is we see that output per worker kind of shifts up to a new growth path, right? And so we see the same process here with investment per worker. The thing I really think is interesting is this is consumption per worker. So consumption per worker, right, is one minus the savings rate times output. So if the savings rate all of a sudden jumps up quite a bit, well then instantaneously you're gonna get a drop down in uh, consumption per worker, right? So the first thing is you get a reduction in consumption per worker from where it was before. And that dotted line is kind of the path that consumption per worker would go on had the savings rate not changed at all. You know, it's just it's a continuation of that trend uh, before the change in the savings rate. So initially you get this drop, but then over time, as output per worker evolves up to the new growth path, we see that consumption worker is now above where it would have been had we not changed the savings rate at all. So that's pretty cool to me, right? I mean, this is this is a demonstration of where if you increase the savings rate, you can demonstrate that uh, this person that this economy leads to a higher consumption per worker, right? But you know, this this fits into the this, the discussion of that golden rate level of savings. The golden rate level of savings is the rate of savings such that we maximize consumption per worker. Um, but remember, so the golden rate level of savings, let me switch to the little graph that I made for it. The golden rate level of savings, this green line is consumption, that yeah, the, the, the red line is output per, per worker. 
and then the green line is consumption per worker. So the consumption per worker, oh yeah, and then the, the horizontal axis are different savings rates. And then the vertical axis are different amounts of either consumption or output. So you can see in the way I've set it up, at a very low savings rate, you get a really low consumption. At an extremely high savings rate, you get extremely low consumption again as well. And that makes sense. You know, if you don't save much, you're not uh, contributing much to capital stock and output per capita is just a function of the capital stock. So it makes sense that if you have a super low savings rate, you're not going to have much um, consumption per worker. Also, if your savings rate is just like extraordinarily high, um, you know, you're not using much of your income to consume. So it makes sense that you have a relatively low um, consumption rate when your savings is extremely high. But we have this like little curve here and the maximum is that golden uh, Golden rule level of, of savings that leads to max that leads you to maximize consumption. So if our goal was to maximize consumption, we see that that's associated with a rate of about 0.33 or 0.34 or so. Uh, in in this setup, it, it depends entirely on the economy you're dealing with, right? So like the don't think you should be saving exactly a third of your income. That's just that's just like a function of the arbitrary parameterization I chose for this particular model. But it, it does mean that there is some level of savings that does maximize consumption, assuming like all the little setups of the model are correct. And the way that I chose it um, meant that by switching from this savings rate to this savings rate, we resulted in higher savings. But you know, I could have chosen things such that we actually, by switching savings rate, we result in a lower consumption per worker. So let's say I chose, we started off with 0.35. Uh, let's say that you know, that's where we're maximizing consumption, but then let's say we increase savings up to 0.8. So uh, we increase savings again, but look what happens. We were at this growth path. We were at this path of uh, consumption per worker, and now we end up at a lower path of consumption per worker. So my point is that for some of those variables, uh, some of those little parameterizations like depreciation, um, the growth rate of technology, the growth rate of the population, there are some absolutes. If you increase it, we're all better off. If you increase the uh, amount of, you know, the growth rate of technology, we're, we're demonstrably better off, right? But the adjusting the savings rate, you know, there's no absolute that if you increase the savings rate, you increase, uh, con you increase, you know, welfare for everyone, right? It all depends, and it depends on the parameterization of the economy. So this is an example where I increase savings and I reduce consumption per worker. Um, you can see output per worker did increase in this case. And actually, output per worker is always going to increase when you increase the savings rate. Okay, so once again, if you increase the savings rate, uh, I've just demonstrated you could decrease consumption per worker. But there are situations, you know, there are parameterizations where you could choose um, change adjustments to the savings rate. Uh, increases to the savings rate such that you end up with a higher consumption per worker. It all depends on the particular parameterization of the economy. So this one's a bit more tricky. You know, what is the effect of an increase in the savings rate? Uh, it depends. It depends on what the savings rate was. It depends on what the savings rate um, is being changed to. And it depends on the other parameterization uh, that you've chosen for the economy. Um, and it, it fits nicely into that golden rule level of savings uh, as well. So hopefully that was clear. Hopefully it was helpful. Sorry it took so long. If you found it helpful, be sure to give a thumbs up and thanks and have a good day. Bye.